You're watching this video because you or someone you know is considering a peripheral blood stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant. A transplant is a long and sometimes difficult procedure, and it usually means spending many weeks in or near a hospital. The good news is that a transplant can save your life, putting the cancer into remission and often curing it. Amelia went through a peripheral blood stem cell transplant to treat her leukemia. She agreed to tell her story to help others learn from a patient's perspective what this intensive treatment experience is like. I'm 33 and I've been married for two and a half years. My husband has been incredibly supportive and uh, my family and I'm a teacher and my students have been very supportive and communicative. The school system that I work for is great. A peripheral blood stem cell transplant is a procedure that's used to treat blood cancers, which are cancers that begin in the bone marrow or lymph nodes. These include acute leukemia, chronic leukemia, multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and Hodgkin's disease. Sometimes bone marrow cells that are taken directly from the donor's bone are transplanted instead of blood stem cells. This procedure, called a bone marrow transplant, is used less commonly. Both the peripheral blood stem cell transplant and the bone marrow transplant are essentially the same in the way they work, which is to rescue blood stem cells or bone marrow stem cells by taking them out of the body, then give them back to a patient after he or she receives intensive chemotherapy. High doses of chemotherapy can effectively kill most or all of the cancer cells. But these chemotherapy drugs also destroy the patient's bone marrow. Bone marrow makes blood, and without it, a patient cannot survive. In a transplant, the patient is given healthy bone marrow or stem cells after getting high-dose chemotherapy. The transplanted cells grow and replace the bone marrow that has been killed. Within medicine, there's something called the dose-response curve, and what that means is the higher dose of chemotherapy we use, the higher destruction of cancer cells that we see. The highest doses we can use will kill as many cancer cells as possible, but one side effect is it will destroy the bone marrow. So what we're actually doing is after we administer chemotherapy, in a sense, we're rescuing the patient by giving them either their own bone marrow or their own blood stem cells or someone else's stem cells. So we're rescuing them by giving them these cells. These cells will go into their body and just start growing in their bone marrow. Whether blood stem cells or bone marrow cells are used, there are basically two types of transplants. One type is called autologous, where we use the patient's own cells to do the transplant. The second type is called allogeneic transplant, and that's when we use someone else's cells to actually do the transplant, and that someone else could either be a sibling um, or an unrelated donor. The transplant procedure takes place over a few months. There are several steps. First, the patient is given chemotherapy to kill as many cancer cells as possible without destroying stem cells. This chemo is used to put the patient into remission. Next, healthy blood stem cells, or bone marrow cells, are collected from the patient or from someone else, usually a relative, whose cells match the patient's cells. These cells are frozen and kept in storage. Following another chemotherapy, this time a very high dose, the bone marrow or stem cells are infused into the patient where they begin to grow and make new bone marrow. Almost all transplants performed worldwide use blood stem cells. Nowadays, it is only in rare cases that marrow is taken directly from the bone. Amelia became a candidate for blood stem cell transplant after she was diagnosed with acute leukemia. This leukemia began when one cancerous cell in her bone marrow gave rise to many daughter cells that spread throughout her bloodstream. She is connected to a machine that is collecting her blood stem cells. But this is not the first step in her transplant process. She has already spent time in the hospital for a course of chemotherapy that eliminated as many of the cancer cells as possible. This first chemo was not the chemo that kills the bone marrow. That comes later in the process. The first chemotherapy was uh, pretty intense, and I did have a lot of side effects from it uh, that we got through, um, but nausea, vomiting, um, and I had some fevers, and I was, in the I was in the hospital for about five weeks recovering. 
Following that first round of chemo, the transplant team did tests to find out how effective it was in reducing cancer cells. We'll do a bone marrow test to analyze and to determine if they have any cancer in their bone marrow. If they do, we won't collect their cells. We'll give them more therapy. If their bone marrow is clean of disease, then we'll go ahead and collect the cells. Amelia has been given a medication that stimulates the growth of these cells and makes them more plentiful for the collection. And so it produces, overproduces stem cells, and so they're collecting them now uh, to give back to me after my next chemotherapy. It's not painful. Uh, it's causing my lips to buzz a little bit uh, because it takes calcium out, and they just put, give me a little more calcium, and that should take care of that. What we actually do is we'll um, hook up a patient to a, a machine, sort of like a dialysis machine. We'll put an IV in one arm, an IV in another arm, and that machine will take the bone marrow cells out of the blood and return the rest of the blood back to the patient. Next, uh, I go home for a month of recovery or so, and then I'll come back in for high-dose chemotherapy. And uh, a week after I get that, I get my, tra my transplant of the stem cells that they're collecting now. Amelia's blood stem cells will stay at the hospital, where they are tested and put into storage. Here in the cellular lab, they are counted, ensuring that enough cells have been collected. They are tested to be sure they are sterile and free of any germs. Then frozen to negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit and stored in a liquid nitrogen freezer until Amelia is ready for the cells to be given back to her in the transplant. I didn't want to get a regular wig, so I got this pink wig. And it's actually been really fun to wear. I don't know if I can do this without a mirror. Pretty well. How are my bangs? Fine. Yeah? A month after collection, Amelia is back in the hospital to undergo an intensive chemotherapy treatment. This begins her second stay in the hospital. Her previous stay was for her first round of chemotherapy before the blood stem cells were collected. This time, she may be here for up to six weeks. For this part of the transplant, many patients can spend nights at home if they live near the hospital or stay in a nearby hotel, coming in every day for therapy. Amelia has been advised to stay in the hospital through the chemotherapy and transplant. The inpatient course is like a roller coaster. Some days they'll feel great, other days they'll feel run down and tired. And what I tell the patients is just keep your eye on the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, you'll get out, and this is the number of days it's going to take, you'll get there, but it's going to be a difficult course till you get there. For the first week of her stay, Amelia is given an intensive chemotherapy that is so strong it will kill her bone marrow. What's happening now is conditioning regimen. My body is mm -hmm. being assaulted by chemotherapy, um, pretty strong chemotherapy for five days. And this is preparing my body for transplant. And how I think of it is that technically I don't have cancer anymore. My leukemia cells are gone and when they check with a bone marrow biopsy, kind of like do the dipstick check and is there anything there? They don't see it, but it only takes one rogue cell for this to all happen again. So this is really scrubbing out, scouring um, my bone marrow. I think that having a good attitude is really important, but there are, there are things that you need to work out in your brain. Like I'm hooked up to chemotherapy drugs that are gonna make me really sick and when you no, you're going to have to go to the hospital and have this done and work that out in your mind and not be stressed out about it. Ask the questions that you need to ask. Advocate for yourself. There are a lot of people on your team who will answer those questions even if they seem silly. But if you're going to lose sleep over it, just call. I feel incredibly well supported uh, at home and at the hospital. And I've tried to just be positive as possible because I think that goes a long way. On the day of the transplant, Amelia's blood stem cells are removed from the freezer and taken to her room, where the transplant will take place. Hi there. Here the cells are thawed and prepared for infusion. The transplant procedure itself is actually rather anticlimactic. Patients will receive months of therapy waiting to get to that transplant, and the actual transplant process is just like a blood transfusion. So whether it's bone marrow or peripheral blood, 
we will infuse the cells intravenously, painless procedure. Patients won't often know we're even doing it unless we let them know. And those cells will go right into their body and gradually get back into their bone marrow. It takes about anywhere from 12 to 14 days for those cells to start growing. Amelia will remain in the hospital until her doctor determines that her blood count is high enough that it's safe for her to go home. She'll stay for three or four weeks. It takes time for the immune system to get back to normal, so Amelia will have to be extra careful to avoid situations that could cause infection. She'll have to stay away from crowds and avoid working the soil in her garden, which she loves. Getting back to normal takes time. So it's been, I think, 37-ish days since my transplant um, or so, and I've been home for about three weeks, and I lost my sense of taste. So everything tasted like cardboard for a while because it's such a monumental thing, such a huge thing that they've just done, and you feel like you want to obviously nourish yourself, and there are a lot of eating problems. Feel tired really easily, and everything sort of revolves around your recovery at home. So even though you're home, it's like a full time job to be getting better. I'm walking every day, which has been really important to me all along. I can't really go a day without taking that walk, so I'm up to uh, almost, almost three miles. I absolutely think exercise is very important to your treatment and recovery. Uh, in a lot of ways, I'm when I felt better after the chemotherapies, I felt much better with my exercise and my better eating than I had for many months before I was diagnosed with leukemia because I had been getting sicker and I hadn't been able to be outside walking. But it's great to get the fresh air and to feel like you're making yourself stronger and you're doing everything you can in this process. And there's only a couple things that I feel I have control over are getting exercise to make my body healthier and eating well, which I did before. There is a chance that in spite of the transplant, Amelia's leukemia may return. In that event, most patients are offered the choice of another transplant. If my leukemia did come back, the plan would be to find an unrelated donor as I don't have any siblings that are a match. And we went with um, an autologous transplant and that we would then have an option of going for an allogeneic transplant, so getting stem cells from somebody else. So that would be the plan if it did come back within the next two years. 2,460. That's awesome. It is awesome. It is awesome. Any patient who is a candidate for a transplant has much to consider. It's a lengthy procedure and at times tiring and uncomfortable. It involves spending long stretches of time in the hospital. On the other hand, for many people, it is a lifesaver. And it's important to keep that in mind during the long weeks of treatment. From the beginning, the patient's conversation with the transplant physician is critical. What are you up to? Um, the most is three miles. Wow. Yeah. That's and, um, amazing. Yesterday I watched... What I recommend to anyone undergoing a transplant is to meet with the transplant physician, ask them outcomes as it pertains to them. In addition, ask that physician what it's going to be like in the ensuing months. Will that patient be seeing the physician? Will that patient be seeing the nurse? Also ask what sort of accreditations the program has. There are certain national criteria that are requested of transplant programs. Those programs that meet those criteria are just a step above or a head above other programs. So here at Dartmouth, we have four national accreditations that again makes us um, a well-known national program. The uniqueness of the transplant program here at Dartmouth is it's very patient-centered, very patient-specific. We built a program here that, that each of us would feel very comfortable sending one of our family members to. Time will tell how effectively the transplant has been in curing Amelia's leukemia. She is satisfied in knowing she has done all she can to treat the disease. She and her husband are home now and have settled into life's normal routines. But for Amelia, as with many cancer survivors, normal means a lot more now than it ever did before. I was an appreciative person before, really appreciated a lot of the small things in my family, but I feel even more gratitude for everything. I feel really happy to be alive. 
I feel really happy to be outside. I feel happy for so many things to be well supported here at the hospital and by friends and family.